testing the um, what were we testing? We were testing the um, oh, we were testing. <laughs> so with that said, uh, let's see if our um, screen, our monitor is projecting one more time. All right. So if it, if if everything is true, then if true, then now hopefully there's a maybe uh, everything should be going through, and the next slide you should see if everything's going right. The risk disclosure. should be saying a risk disclosure. All right. Uh, tell me we have risk disclosure. I'm trying to do these presentations and we should have a smiley face and everything should be working well. The worst smiley face on the planet. Uh, double Y, if this is the worst smiley face, probably not a full circle. It's not, it's an ecliptical one, uh, but we'll move on. Please take a moment. I think we're all good now. Triple Y, thank you, Mary, very much. Uh, we've got uh, the risk up. We've got sound is good, level, everyone can hear. This is wonderful because today really is I think for individual traders, probably going to be one of your most important webinars that you see in, in for a very long time. So let's get going. And I mean that because we have a lot of important uh, things to discuss today. So let's begin. Now, first and foremost, if some of you, you probably, uh, I promised I sent out a tweet. Many of you are familiar with the Persons Planet uh, website. We have... Um, a lot of great information on that website. I'll just bring it into uh, focus real quick. The um, resources that are on here are, are fabulous. Videos, uh, you can see the industry reports that we've put out, articles we've written, but also we have our Twitter account, which every once in a while, I, I put out something that's non-market specific, but typically I like to put something out about um, the markets, five stocks to swing trade, August 28th, we put uh, Triple D, which is some of you guys right, might remember, Micron, Navistar, Perigo, and NXP Semiconductors, and then the LCD, which stands for Low Closed Doji Bearish Signal in Emerging Markets. Um, and then we have, of course, Biotech. And, and if you look over here about a few things, um, we did a presentation with TradeStation. And then back here on August 10th, a little tricky on the pullback, but check out Juno. We were bullish on Juno uh, Therapeutics, and that's why I said someone asked, would you go over what that setup in Juno was? How did you pick out of all of the stocks in, in the biotech sector, what what really picked Juno out? And I'll share that with you today. Uh, very specific uh, indicators that we, we have. We're going to give you a seasonal outlook on specific markets as we exit September. It's not just seasonal trends of markets we have to look out for. It's also what's going on politically in Washington with fiscal policy, namely two words, tax reform, yes or no, health care, yes or no. So Washington comes back to work. In fact, Washington, believe it or not, they are kind of back to work um, in, in a, in a uh, shortened session. It's just kind of like let's come back, clean out the cobwebs before they go away or the uh, Memorial Day weekend. We're going to, so we'll give those specific markets and outlooks out to you. We're going to talk about algorithmic trading developments and what's going on in the world and some upcoming critical current events. So let's get started rolling up the sleeves. First and foremost, many of you will be familiar with the high closed doji at monthly support. Wow. How original. John Person. That is exactly uh, still to this day uh, looking at the either a PPS buy or the high closed doji at monthly pivot support, the combination of what we call candles and pivots, which is the book that was the title of a book that came out darn close to uh, 14 years ago now. 
but this is a volume indicator that's in terms of percent change and showed that there was a rise in the volume with that. But here's the real culprit, uh, another triple whammy. We like to call this a three pattern event. Price pattern, condition of volume, and relative strength. So the person's market catcher, which we released earlier this year, so for all of those who have the uh, person's uh, lifetime indicator with TradeStation, that's a, a, a component of what we had. All right, so there's where Juno came from, and it, and I'll, I had no idea it was going to go here. I mean, I mean, anyone, I mean, if anything, it's a nice trade it's going up, and you know, a, a little scale out, but uh, it was a good identification, and that's why we were. I wouldn't say my obsession with Juno, but it was certainly I thought relative to the other markets in that space, uh, it was just a fabulous pick based on right there. High closed OG, relative strength, it populated on our scans, we move on. Now, September through October, is this is the time where we come through, uh, I wouldn't say kind of scary, but September's like everyone's going to get back from their three-day holiday weekend, we'll come back to the markets, and then what happens in September? We have a lot of different seasonal supply and demand changes that occur. Washington goes back to work literally on September 1st in what they call a pro forma session. I'm not making up that term. It's called a pro forma session on 9-1. That's Friday. Okay, so I believe it's Friday. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's Friday with the unenjoyment report, which is Friday. So the first, this is two days from now. Today's Wednesday. Friday. This week starts September. And we have the unemployment. I affectionately call it the unenjoyment report, but uh, we have the unemployment report out on Friday. Washington's coming back to work. That means everyone, both sides of the aisle, is going to be wanting to get in front of a microphone to make their constituents feel like they're they're getting their money's worth. Now, we're also going to be seeing in September one heck of a push for uh, flooding, relief for Houston and Texans who have gone through a horrific ordeal. And I am here to tell you personally, friends, I had been flooded out of my house and home in Chicago three times in the 100-year flood that would never happen again. And how horrific is it when you call your contractor up or guys that you know that are in the trades and you say, hey, I need help. Uh, my, my furniture's floating in our finished basement and, and the whole neighborhood's underwater. And they go, yeah, tough luck, pal. Me too. My family comes first. And you're stuck all by yourself and rotted furniture, sewage, and God knows what else is going on. It is devastating for people that can't help themselves. So we want to make sure that, you know, it's not just giving and talking and saying prayers, but Red Cross, pack up old, uh, by the way, I wanted to make this mention, something that we're looking at, 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 at we're starting to do ourselves here at home, is we're taking old luggages that might be bent, broken, whatever, if you traveled as much as my wife and I have at, at various conferences around the world, uh, we go through, we pack some stuff, go to TJ Maxx, go to Marshalls, buy some new stuff, rip off the price tags so people don't know, you know, I don't care, Clarence, whatever. But buy some good stuff for some folks that may not want to wear their ragged, soaked clothes. Um, and, and then just ship that right over there to the uh, Red Cross. Uh, cash donations are always good. Now, we can't, I mean, you figure some of these rap stars and some of these movie stars are making $10, $15 a movie, and they get 25 or 50 grand. I mean, they spend 25 or 50 grand on their Gucci sneakers at the MTV Awards. So, I mean, don't feel bad that you have to kill yourself, but I think the conscious effort to help Houstonians uh, recover, these are small things that we could do. You know, not a bad idea. Get a, I wouldn't say a, a poor, mint, non-mint condition piece of luggage, but go to TJ Maxx, go to Marshalls, whatever. Buy some stuff, throw it in there, ship it on over to your Red Cross. All right. So I'm sure we will see in September more fundraising events that comes up and will be a part of that, but keep that in mind. For the most part, in September, kids are coming back to school. More importantly, September's generally been a very slow month in the market or in commerce. And one of the reasons is vacation bills pour in. People went on the summer vacation, they did whatever, and the vacation bills pour in mid-month. By the way, Wells Fargo, that's what WFC stands for, Wells Fargo Healthcare Conference, September 7th. So you may want to mark your calendars for that if you find that biotech spike for whatever reason. There's a biotech 
our healthcare conference in Boston on September 7th. Third quarter window dressing occurs September 15th. That Friday is when options expire. So that's, uh, remember, September's the end of the third quarter. This is it, baby. The Federal Reserve, oh, here's the one. The Federal Reserve meets on the 19th and 20th to dictate interest rates. The um, unemployment report this Friday is actually going to be fairly important. And the reason is, is wage cost pressures continue to rise. Average hourly work week, or if there's an adjustment to past reports that shows maybe there was an uptick in employment numbers, Fed will be, I think there'll be some talk on the table that instead of uh, the Fed raising a quarter point, I think there could be some talk that the Fed might have room to raise in one fell swoop a half a point. If the two words that the market really wants to hear about is called tax reform, and the more that that looks like tax reform goes through, the counterbalance to that would be perhaps the Federal Reserve, who likes to take the punch bowl from the party away sometimes, could see an increase to combat that fiscal stimulus with a half point uh, rate hike. And keep in mind, balance sheet, reduction of balance sheet, which means they're Long bond holdings. So long bond holdings, by the way, is what the balance sheet's all about. Uh, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. The Fed's got all these bonds and, and assets, mortgage-backed asset um, vehicles, instruments that they use to add to liquidity to the banking system. They hold all the supply. And if they're going to reduce that balance sheet, that means translation. Liquidate their holdings. Who do they sell it to? Foreign governments, our government, our government is us, taxpayers. So someone's going to get stuck holding the bag on this, and that's why Treasury bonds, everyone's been banking that bonds are going to uh, go down. Alan Greenspan just mentioned a couple weeks ago that bonds were in a bubble. Well, if he thought bonds were in a bubble when the 30-year Treasuries were at 152, I'm sure he thinks they're in even more of a bubble at 156. So we got our eyes out on bonds. So... That's what we have to deal with this uh, month coming out. I mean, that's obviously a lot of stuff. And we have the government debt ceiling debate, and the government debt ceiling is due. We set the budget for the government. And then finally, this is the month where we get the Jewish High Holy Week, which is called, it begins with Rosh Hashanah on September 21st, and then ends with Yom Kippur on 930. Now, if you're a seasonal trader, if you were trading at the Board of Trade, guess what? You knew that, you know, sometimes people buy stocks before Rosh Hashanah and get out before Yom Kippur. This year might be a little bit different because of where we are within the expiration of 915. So we've got to kind of look out for those types of um, issues. Another old school, and I'm talking old school, was it was also a good time to buy wheat. So I'm just laying this on out there that wheat prices, generally you bought before Rosh Hashanah and you sold wheat on Yom Kippur. So there's, there, there is that seasonality for whatever reason for that in that coincidental time frame. So I just thought I'd bring that up to you. If you're into looking at certain seasonalities and effects of supply and demand changes, these are the big events that are coming out at the you can bet your bottom dollar. Two of the biggest things on the board here is uh, the Federal Reserve, and this one right there, Washington. Let's see if they get back to work, and let's see if we get tax reform done. Next. Big month ahead, right? So roll up your sleeves. Vacation to party's over, kids. Now, here's the thing. The S&Ps, from a seasonal trend, the S&Ps um, tend to see mid-month slumps into triple witching, which is what we call that quarterly window dressing. All right? So quarterly window dressing tends to, um, you know, we get that uh, end of quarter portfolio managers, people are succumbing to maybe taking profits, so we see a lot of sector rotation. Now, from a commodity trader's almanac, as an ex-contributor uh, and, and co-author, uh, of, part of our work was obviously to look at commodities and stocks and ETFs that were correlated to these. So here's the thing. Despite Hurricane uh, Harvey, Natural gas tends to move higher into October, so that would be for you uh, ETF traders. Watch UNG and watch 
uh, natural gas related stocks to see if they hold true to the ten tendency for the move in uh, from October, uh, September into October. Gold prices tends to peak out in late September into, and then from mid late September, excuse me, until around the 1st of October, it tends to go down until mid-December. Watch out for gold. This is a market that could chop around up here. Maybe it's got a little bit more life to it. Test the highs of that 13, 30, 40 number. Um, watch the gold because gold tends to peak out. I've seen some really nasty trends, reversals. People get involved. The stock market may seem weak, and then people go and they buy gold as a you know a hedge uh, and, and, and as a flight to quality, and then bang, uh, rug pull out from under you. So be careful of that seasonal tendency. Next, for commodity traders, watch live cattle prices. Now, I don't know how this is going to play out with, you know, the flood in Houston. Uh, there's talk about, of course, there was uh, in two counties where uh, about, uh, it's about the third largest, believe it or not, uh, Texas is about the third largest producer of oranges, Valencia oranges for orange juice production. Um, they have a huge production for grapefruit, and, and there may have been some damage not getting a lot of publicity there. We don't trade grapefruit futures, but orange juice uh, didn't see uh, a, a big impact. But uh, there's reports that International Paper IP, they have a lot of corrugated factories uh, down in Texas, and, and there's just going to be all kinds of different ripple effects that are going to uh, plague the market uh, potentially. I want you guys to kind of focus on what I have a seasonal tendency of, of, of controlling, so to speak. And live cattle prices is one. So B tends to move up in, from now into mid-December. So you want to watch for cattle price rises in the front month versus the back month contract. So bull spreads will be uh, featured over the, and, and, and for a lot of professional traders, will be looking at bull spreads in cattle. So that's another thing. Now, also, the dollar, the U.S. dollar typically has declined in past years, but this year, this year, it's out of sync with its normal trends. The Federal Reserve raises interest rates, and the dollar went down. The Fed raised interest rates again, the dollar went down. So a lot of people are thinking there's better opportunities in emerging markets, so they're selling dollars, buying assets abroad. I don't know if that's going to continue, and I want everyone to be aware that we are seeing some relative strength coming into the dollar at some real strong support at yesterday's low. I'll show you a chart on that in just a few minutes. In fact, why bother? Let's get into it right now. Let me just share with you a uh, this chart before we get into that stuff. And we'll go over here to uh, the futures and we'll look at the dollar index up here somewhere. Here it is. So real quick, the dollar... Um, we're looking at some interesting support levels on versus monthly pivots and uh, looking at the relative strength. I don't typically like to look at the dollar per se as its relative strength against the U.S. equity markets, but I will say there are some, we covered this in our, to our community this morning, there are some very strong uh, coincidental factors, right? So a couple things that I'm going to tee up for you here is looking at the U.S. dollar. And you can see this thing just, I mean, it's, it just got beaten with the ugly stick. I mean, so, I mean, since the beginning of the year, this thing, since, I mean, it just keeps, it, it, it's ugly. I mean, there's no other word for it, except for right now. We're uh, floating because it's not the Globex. Um, or ICE is not closed yet, but um, if you notice that there was a doji yesterday, there's going to be potentially a high closed doji. If you take a look at the lows here and the closing lows there, they're lower. The volume percent change is higher and the relative strength is improving. It kind of signifies that we have a potential interim low forming in the U.S. dollar. If there's an interim low forming in the U.S. dollar, then there must be or there might be an interim top forming in the euro currency. So let's take a look at that thesis and see what it looks like. And you know what? It's almost the exact opposite picture. We have a kind of a higher high, a guy by the name of Arthur Merrill, who is big on looking at patterns, especially 
M tops and W bottom formations. And this would have been considered what technically was called a Arthur Merrill M11 top, whereas the number two point was higher than the number one point. And uh, that would be consistent with a, a false breakout. In, in, in conclusion, the volume analysis also shares there is a divergence, meaning the second high was on weaker volume. Divergences don't show up at every high, but they show up a lot of times at important tops. So there could be a retracement shortly in the euro currency as we back into the maybe 116.5, 117 uh, zone here. So um, what would be the catalyst that could cause that? I'm thinking the unemployment report out on Friday. How's that sound? Okay. So that's what we wanted to kind of take a look at about the U.S. dollar. More importantly, this month of September, why do we see a lot of uh, mid-month slumps with the S&Ps? Well, here, look at all the sectors that tend to decline during the month of September. Semis, materials, industrials, aerospace and defense, um, drug, pharmaceutical, internet, biotech, regional banks, insurance companies, retail, and gambling. That's the BJK. So we tend to see a lot of sectors that weaken between now and in October. But Keep in mind, every single one of these sectors tend to post bottoms between very late September into early October. So September can bring some profit taking ahead of the quarter. It can follow through into October. And I think we need to kind of pay attention to that because this year, a lot of seasonal trends have been kind of thrown out the window. But we still need to understand why. And what they have been thrown out of the window is because the expectations of extra fiscal stimulus to the, to the economy. And it's not just here, it's abroad. What's going on with France? What's going on with Brexit? All of these things are going to have, uh, again, fiscal policy are going to have dynamic effects on the market. And then the counterbalance to that is the global central bankers and their desire to do what? Get out of the hole and pass the buck to all that quantitative easing assets that they've purchased. So therefore, there's this big balance and shift that could be coming. And into September, this time around is different, friends. So you want to be aware of that. This time, don't be complacent, OK? Uh, lastly, technology tends to um, rally at the end of September, and that's been recent decades or in the last 10 years since the iPhone came out and the iPod came out with Apple's product launch. So this is the 10-year anniversary of Apple, and we'll get back into looking at those, that type of thing. And of course, you will be hearing more about the peripheral companies that go into helping to build the Apple iPhone and to see how big their launch really is. So this is an exciting time for the company in Apple and combined with tax reform uh, also to find out if they're going to repatriate their billions of cash hoarding that they're holding over in Europe. So seasonal trends, guys, we've got an enormous amount of if, there, if there's ever anything to pay close attention to the month of September, we have a high religious holy holiday. The Washington's back to kind of work. We haven't heard from really Washington in a while, right? I mean, it's not like we've been hearing uh, the bickering. It's, it's been, you know, uh, it, it's been an interesting battle. I don't want to get into uh, politics, but I'm a trader. And I mean, the markets, Washington sets policy. If you follow Washington like the smart money does, um, just remember way back in the day when they were making uh, reform with ethanol contracts. Remember that? Corn prices surged and anything that was a company that had ethanol to do with it soared. So paying attention to what, where the money is going, what entitlement programs are going to get cut, what entitlement programs are going to benefit, that's where you'll find businesses and stock prices will be affected. Keep that in mind. All right. Now, what else is new this fall? You guys may really be interested in this. I'm not sure if there's a lot of algo traders out there in this world, but I'm here to tell you something, gang. 
it's something special. And I know I've done a lot of different webinars uh, out there and uh, in the technical analysis community, uh, really help to uh, distribute different ways to trade and strategies. But I'm here to tell you, this is interesting. What's new this fall? Well, Wall Street's hiring a new breed of super quants. I mean, as if you didn't think that quantitative analysis and algorithmic programmers wasn't, you know, enough. There's a special, super duper, a special secret probation class. I mean, if you were an Animal House lover, remember the scene where uh, Dean Wormer says they're on double secret probation? Well, now there's a double secret um, class of PhD mathematicians, and it's going to be called uh, data scientists. I'm not joking you. New York University is going to start this new program in September. It's the first doctorate program in the nation with the classification of data scientists. And it's specifically, specifically, and here's a funny thing, Harvard and MIT, they're going to start a data science master's program in 2018. Right? So why? To meet the needs of Wall Street. What are these data scientists? The focus is to develop machine learning, cleaning charts, and knowing how to mine data. Tell you what, stare at that, check it out, you can Google this, NYU is starting this new program this September. So what's new this fall? That's pretty new. To meet the needs of Wall Street. Wall Street's hiring smarter computer sciences to program and trade their algorithms. So with that said, and with all this other stuff that's going on in the market, do we stand a chance? And can we beat these pros at their own game? I mean, this is kind of wild, right? How many people find that wild? Put a Y if you think that's wild. Why for, yeah, pretty wild and no. It, what took them so long? Bruce and John got a pretty Y. And, um, I mean, it, what took them so long? How they figure this out? Here's an interesting thing. You know, there's a real interesting article that came out about this. Uh, doctorate program with this uh, topic data scientist. It came from, if I'm not mistaken, this you may want to Google. It came from um, it came from two guys that worked in Silicon Valley that were hiring people in um, at Facebook. By the way, one guy was uh, was a uh, the head engineer designer at Facebook, um, and. And, and so they put an ad out there for, for computer programmers and no one replied. They put one out for a data scientist and everyone applied. So they came up with the term themselves and then from data mining and understanding machine learning, artificial intelligence, it kind of boomed into uh, Wall Street. So uh, that's, the, that's the, the secret behind that. So... It's kind of funny, how do we extract information to get clues into trading and trends in the market? We all have heard about social media, and you see how many hits on a stock are out there in social media, the people are trading, and kind of for a contrarian aspect. But I think, as it is right now, uh, friends, the trading in the markets, I think that we still stand a chance to beat the prop traders and institutions at their own game. But it, I think there's a couple things. You're going to need proven tactics to make sound trading decisions. You have to have cutting-edge technology and great auto execution. And you need some trade system optimization skills. Now, those are some big topics right there, enough probably that we can't cover everything in today's presentation. Um, here's the thing. Uh, Jerome, hey, good to see your name, Jerome. He met a data miner scientist on Sunday. Very informative. And so this is a this is what we're up against as far as trading in the markets right now. Okay, um, how do we get ahead of them? Now some of us have a good, uh, I guess, unless you have insider trading information, and that's always helpful. It's illegal, but it's helpful. It's just helpful until you get caught, right? I mean, this is bottom line. Um, and that was a joke, so I'm not telling anyone to trade illegally. I'm just saying insider information does help to make a guaranteed profit, right? Um, but algorithmic trading has forever given the edge in favor to those who have access to it. So, I mean, it does. I mean, you, you have the edge. Uh, data mining is just simply to help develop a system. And so we have a lot of product and programs already that have data. 
Now it's just a matter of trying to put things together. Um, it's very tough to find guys uh, with computer science degrees right now on Wall Street. They're all working for Wall Street. That's the thing, not traders. Uh, algorithmic sequences is what we need to develop and backtest the system. And then finally, what else we need and what, what the computer algo traders are taking over is they got faster auto execution. They know where their stops are, their profit targets. And all of that needs to be extremely efficient in the marketplace. That's a fact. So what goes into algo systems? It's kind of funny. You look at like John Ellers who did cycles, and you look at some of uh, the work there. It's kind of funny because if you take the my favorite topic is, as I develop my own system, the pivot, the high-low close divided by three. You know, that pivot point right there, high-low close divided by three, what we do with that typical price to define a cycle between an old high and a, an old low and to see what the time frame is or the standard deviation between cycles of highs and lows, pivots. So cycles was defined by highs and lows. Remember, what goes into an algo system, something I've been teaching for decades, it's real simple. We all have, it all comes down to the basic product of these four little things called the open, the high, the low, the close. But it's the interaction with those. What's the difference between yesterday's close and today's high and low? Isn't that a way of defining ATR and volatility? What's there between the high, low, and close divided by three? Well, that's pivot. What about the close as it relates to the open? That gives you range. Um, you know, what's the close as it relates to 20 closes ago? That will help to find a, a trend. Moving averages. So we've got pivots and then Fibonacci's and all kinds of indicators. And pretty much every indicator is based on one of these four products, open, high, low, close. Uh, we have volume. We have the volume trend, OBV. Variable weighted average price volume. Uh, or we have bid and ask. We can de determine what the size is between the bid and the ask. Um, percent change in valuation. So instead of looking at a market that was up 10 bucks, the market was only up a half percent. So various ways of, of identifying, measuring, rate of measurement is what goes into an algo system. Standard deviation, another big word, right? Condition of the markets. Um, who's in the market? The consensus reports from the commitment of traders is pretty important. I personally know a fund, a very large fund, in New Jersey, huge fund, by the way, they have a, uh, a way of taking the commitment of data, the commitment of traders' data, and using that information, and what they do is they have a synthetic rate of measurement, and I, we, we do this here, and it's called the threshold of pain. If you see that student body left, small speculators are short the market, and you can kind of figure out the average price they're short from, what is the threshold of pain that makes them bail out when they lose? $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, right? When you figure trading commodities is like eating potato chips, no one ever does just one. You compound the rate of, of, of uh, losses, and you can say, well, some people add to their losers. It's just a, a way of life for some people, right? And, and so these guys have developed an algorithm to help determine when a market might hit a peak price based on the position of the small speculators and their formula for what's called the threshold of pain factor. How's that for amazing? That's no joke. Running billions of dollars of money based on threshold of pain factor. That's a that's a pretty unusual topic that no one really wants to touch on in the real world. We also condition on equities, looking at the advanced decline, the breadth of the market, as we like to say. Uh, I've already touched on ATR, average true range and volatility, and then we've already covered seasonality. And then relative strength. What's relative strength? The person's market catcher. I'm comparing the market like Juno to the overall market. So I think John Kay uh, in our room just said it's going to get a whole lot more sophisticated really fast. I mean, you would think 
this market, I mean, we don't have time to slow down with the uh, sophistication, but we do. I mean, if you think about it, this is a pretty sophisticated indicator in of itself um, in, of looking at relative strength in four stages. Uh, weakening is red, improving is fuchsia, bright blue is improving, and dark blue is weakening. So this kind of gives me a rate of measurement of where markets, prices, stocks are in relationship to um, their, the overall market. Uh, so when I take a look at my radar screen, and this is the person's lifetime package, and I'm here to tell you guys, this is probably one of the most powerful tools that any trader could ever have in front of them to help determine indicated sell signal, buy signal, strength of trend at, at just a scroll of a wheel. I can tell you how many stocks are generating fresh new daily buy signals and how many of those stocks, like an ETF like the Qs, are generating a buy signal and the relative strength versus the S&P is improved. Semis, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, industrial. I can, at a click of a finger, say, well, where's the weakest sector? And I know it's uh, OIH. I know it's USO, I know it's XOP, I know it's the airlines, the energy, the regional banks. All of this stuff is bad, negative. It's all negative to relative to the S&P. There's our fine line. Here's the crappiest sectors in the market. Here's the better sectors to the market. Real simple, right? It's ironic that, I mean, I don't know why we, I even have this, but the solar energy, who would have thought solar energy to um, sector, which is the ETF called TAN, has outperformed the market. It's starting to weaken a bit, but it's outperformed the market relative in terms of percent changes. Now, I'm not saying it's going to continue, but here's the thing that this this person's indicator package tells me, where are we in relationship to quarterly pivot support? Where are we in relationship to monthly analysis? I have short-term, intermediate, longer-term percent. By the way, since we're coming close to the end of the month, I thought I'd just take it um, just one step at a time. We're almost on the verge of brand new sell signals for the month. And, and I mean, when I say on the verge, talk about an algorithmic sell signal. This low, we are so close. We were there in the IWM, and we've rallied back. And now we're back up to its moving average components. We're two, uh, two days or uh, one day away from closing out the month. Are we going to generate a new sell signal for the Russell IWM, or will it fade away? It just may fade away. So how many new fresh monthly signals are we going to get? How many new fresh monthly buy signals are we going to get? I'll let you know tomorrow on the close. But we can take a, these flashing, blinking lights are telling me these are all the stocks and the sectors that are starting to generate fresh, longer-term monthly sell signals. This one's called Restoration Hardware. Had a wonderful run-up earlier this year, and now it's starting to form a new, fresh monthly sell signal. That doesn't mean it's going to go straight to, you know, straight down. It could rally up just a tad and then roll over. But it's not promising when it generates a monthly PPS sell signal, right? Uh, a longer-term monthly sell signal. So it's very interesting to find out at what I love to do at the end of the week, the end of the month, how many signals are generating. It gives me an edge so that I know how to prepare myself uh, for the next time frame. I'm going to get an indication of this so I can say by the close Thursday, which is the end of the month, how many stocks generated fresh new buy signals, how many stocks and sectors generated fresh new uh, buy signals, buy and sell signals. So by the way, that's, that's kind of an interesting algorithmic way to identify market behavior. Now, as far as these prop firms and a trading system, as I promised what I was going to cover today was some algo and this is a kind of a very, as I mentioned, and I'm not going to tease you any longer, this is probably one of the most important webinars that you guys will have uh, the ability to attend in my work and my career. Let me repeat that. If you've ever been to any of my presentations before, um, I've spoken from Egypt at Sharm el-Sheikh for the IFTA. 
to, in Bosnia, UBS Warburg, in Zurich. I've been all over giving presentations on my work. You've probably seen me at various expos and conferences. Some of my books were known to be the foremost leading uh, in, in pivot and moving average studies uh, with a defined setup and signal. So they, they've really been helpful in the um, trading community. We've developed some pretty decent uh, systems in our past life, but I'm here to tell you right now, we've worked on something a very long time, and it's, it is something that is just coming like it's, it's incredible. And I think if, if you could have access to a prop firm's trading system, how amazing would that be, right? If you had access to optimizing a strategy that could be applicable across multiple markets in various time frames, that would be insane, right? I mean, so whether it's trading an hourly S&P, a five-minute S&P, maybe trading the spiders, end of day, daily, 60-minute, how helpful that would that be if you had back testable and to be able to optimize the system yourself? That would be pretty cool, which why would you do that anyway? Because market conditions, volatility, ranges change, and you have to adjust for those periods of volatility. When volatility or ranges move higher, something we all want to see, that means profit targets would be expanded. When you have a volatility level or trading ranges that contract, how can you, for example, in, we had the S&Ps with about a two-point handle in the spiders back in May. You know, it, it contracted 50% to nearly a one-point handle in the spiders. If you have a system that's asking to get a profit target of a one and a half points, you can't get one and a half points when a market only has a one-point range. It's like you're trying to get blood out of a turnip. It's just not going to happen. So you have to be able to adjust for that change in volatility. That's what I mean. So if you're a beginner trader and you don't know what I just said, stick around because you're going to have to need to know this stuff because, as as we've just said, it's going to get a lot more sophisticated real fast, and I'm only scratching the surface here. But if you knew that the average or above average risk were in a system so that you could stand the heat, like if you're wrong four or five times in a row, you kind of can, be, you can deal with that because not every trade is going to be a winner. You're going to have situations you're going to get slapped in the face. You know, it's like a cost of doing business. I know my emails say that people win 100 times in a row, and, you know, I only need to spend two minutes a day studying the markets or two minutes a month, and it's real easy. And, and you know, and I know that's not necessarily true, right? So if you knew as long as you had Internet connection and it was connected, you could trade fairly with algo professionals, that would be amazing. I mean, the key word there. Your internet needs to be connected if you're trading algorithmically because it's computer generated sending signals to the server to the exchange for execution. Now, what's been probably your biggest frustration in this business? Markets start to move, you want in, and you miss the bid, you put the, your price in, you place a limit order, it hits your limit order. You're trying to buy at a quarter, it hits a quarter, hits a quarter, or you're trying to buy at 78 and the damn low is 92, right, on a stock, and you miss it by 17 lousy pennies on a $150 stock, 17 lousy cents, right? And the market takes off without you. That's frustrating. How about the markets are flat for hours, and you're looking for this one setup, and the minute you walk away, because you've had three cups of coffee, and, and, you, and you take a bio break. As soon as you walk away, the trade you've been waiting for triggers and you're not in it. Now, come on. That's happened to all of us, right? You get in. You get stopped out. That stinks. I get right back in again. And then you get stopped out again. And then you say, forget this. It's choppy. No way. And then the third time, that's when it was even a better setup, but you didn't get in. And that's the one you should have been in, right? And it would have made all your losses back and more. So that's kind of like what's frustrating about trading sometimes. Or your confidence is so crushed that you don't want to take the risk. Hey, there's a, a an X amount of risk on this trade. It's the greatest setup in the world, but it's bigger risk than I would want to take. If I was stronger in my confidence and if I was on a stronger roll, I would take that trade. 
but I get choosy. You start getting choosy when you're on a losing streak, right? And you don't take the risks. And what happens? Bang, that's the winner. You know, Tom Baldwin, the famous floor trader at the Chicago Board of Trade, used to say the best trades were the one that gave him butterflies in his stomach. It's like, oh, God, I shouldn't do this. But I... And those are the ones that were the best trades. So how many of us can relate to this? You buy, you get stopped out, and your signals say to go reverse and sell short, but you don't. And that was the big winner. That happens a lot in this market. We call it the pump and then dump, or the dump and then pump, right? Well, I'm going to introduce to you guys something we've been working on over eight years. It's called my ultimate algo optimizer. It has stops, risk managements defined. It chooses your position size based on capital. It chooses your position size based on leverage or per trade risk. Three different ways that you can choose your position size depending on the market you're trading. Leverage futures, a fixed per trade, meaning one lot, two lot, 20 lot, 10 lot. Stocks based on risk per trade or on capital you want to invest per trade, a percentage. I'm only going to put in 4% of my overall capital. I'm only going to put in X amount of positions per risk. So you can choose the different size positioning. That's incredibly important. The amount of time in your trade, meaning is this a, a, a holding period or is this the product or the optimization of time in trade based on a 5-minute signal, 15-minute signal, a 60-minute signal, a daily signal. Control over optimization when volatility starts to change. And I define volatility, as you should, by price swings in the market. Next, you've got products to trade like stocks, ETFs, ETN, and futures. So let's take a gander real quick. This is um, the last couple weeks in the ES. Not a great time in the market. With this system, it generates the entry the stop loss, and the profit target. It gets you in, places your stop, and holds until you get out. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a bad system. And this just trades, this is uh, the results of two lots over this period of time. In the S&P 500, by the way. Now, this is impressive. This is off the charts. This is this ETN. It's called the VIX, the VXX. This thing is destined for failure. Because there is, a, as an ETN, it's a, it's, it trades off the VIX futures. And so what it means by destined for failure, it always goes down. It's not, it, they just did its, I think, third, which I tweeted that out as well, its third reverse split. They just did a four for one reverse split. Um, so this is a product that when the market um, goes down, this flies up. So the VIX, it follows, it's a fear factor. In a bull market in equities, this thing always go down. Eventually, you get these little tiny spikes in the market, and you can take long positions. But um, here's just the example of this product, by the way. Look at what I say, destined for failure. It makes a boatload more money taking short signals than it does long signals. And this is the performance, by the way, since 2009. It's an amazing, amazing product. And you know what? It, uh, it's provided a heck of a profit. We can go through these numbers in, in more detail, by the way. I think you'll enjoy it. Gold, over the last two weeks. Now, I'm just going through two weeks of volatility of the market. Um, and I just wanted you to know, this is not just long only. This is long and short. And you'll notice it doesn't trade excessively, but it's traded recently more long than short. So it's prop decent, again, trading simply two lots. Not one lot, not ten lots, two lots. So it has some pretty uh, compelling uh, profit targets that are set in the market. That's why you get these fuchsia levels and the um, yellow level. So you get your... Your entry based on the profit target, so you know where your stop will be and you know where to get out, more or less, in the market, right? That's kind of cool. This is the E-mini S&Ps again, um, and I, I put this in because this was as before coming into today. 
and it, it actually made a little bit more money today, so I thought I'd add that other chart in for you guys just to get you real time. This is a different time frame uh, in that same period. So if you're if you're just trading two lots and you're just trading at specific times during the day, this is a five minute holding period. Five minutes shorter term, you'll probably have less risk, and obviously total number of trades more. Shorter term, higher trades, lower risk. Now, if you have a commission uh, factor of around five and a half, six dollar range. You've got to take into consideration your overall profitability on your commissions as well. So having a factor of two things, getting into a trade, flexibility of when to trade the thing, getting out, and then seeing how the thing revolves over taking trends of the market. It's a very incredible tool. So crude oil, I mean, crude oil has been over the last couple of weeks uh, kind of, you know, straight down, as you can see, this is not done just longs or shorts, it's done both. It's a very powerful system that generates greater profits than losses. Not every trade's a winner, and you better get used to that. But if you know what your risks are, and you know what the performance of the system is, I mean, you'll be able to compete against the hedge funds who can get into the trade and get out of the trade like that little trend before anyone can just turn their head. That's what's kind of cool about, as you can see, even looking at buy signals and its holding period of when the heck to get out of Dodge. So it does a, a phenomenal job. This is uh, for Euro currency traders. Uh, this again, same. this is a little bit longer time period. Uh, it, it was up a little bit. Uh, I thought it was a little too much. I went higher, uh, longer term over the last uh, month and a half. Uh, you know, the last two weeks, it was just, it was killing it. But um, needless to say, from yesterday's overbought condition, uh, holding period, these are amazing, amazing results. So how to auto-execute your trades. This is what's neat about this product. You choose your optimized settings for the time frame you wish to trade. You can choose to auto-execute using TradeStation's unique features. You can manually select if you want to take the trade or simply run it with a, without alerts. I'll show you what I mean. And you can also set up strategy positions to alert of new trades. So you can just say, generate the strategies for display and auto-execute and warn me, or you can turn that off when there's an actual trade. And you'll see what trade you're in. And this is as of today, of course. Uh, you can see what trade you're in. You can see what the position is. And uh, we run this thing with just for everything that we were sharing with you today, two lots only. Right? We don't need to get crazy. And I'll share that with you in just a quick sec. This is what's pretty neat about giving the retail trader an edge. I can say I want to trade the European session and I want to change that time and I want to only trade this time of the day. I have the position calculation method number three. One, position value. Two, position size risk. Three, position size. So three is set on simple two lots. So you can actually format. We allow you to have the controls to optimize what you trade, when you trade, and how much you trade. Now, you can put a hundred lot there. If you ain't have, if you don't have the money to trade, it's not going to let you trade. So, uh, just uh, as a quick reference point. But for retail traders, nobody, and I mean nobody, has come up to allow you, the retail trader, to fight fairly and have a system that has that testable results, auto execution, and be able to optimize the darn thing yourself for what you want to trade. Now, the, uh, this, is, this is why, I, I mean, this is pretty exciting stuff. You can actually look at your strategy positions as the market's trading, and you can either piggyback that, trade in real time, trade it automatically, or you can turn it on and say, you know, I like this setup. I'm going to turn it on. I have to go to the bathroom. And if you come back and all of a sudden it's got you in, you know that you're going to get your stop automatically set and your profit target's going to hit. Now, notice this thing says max bars. The trade was in for a maximum period that typically it gets out. So if it doesn't happen within the time frame you think, boom, 
you've got several different features to help you out in, in its, its uh, algorithm. So it's not just based on simple price. It's also based on other factors as well. It's a very in, insane product. So why is this so special? I mean, a lot of systems, you can rent systems to trade. They go from $89 to $350 a month. And it controls your position size, meaning you can only trade one lot, a two lot. You can only trade X amount of, of, of positions per your monthly lease date of that strategy. And they're black boxes. You can't optimize or change them for your own trading times and style. Like, for example, I mentioned if you want to trade in the overnight session. The Algo Optimizer allows you to custom tailor the time sessions you trade, auto trade or manually trade, meaning trade it automatically for me, or alert me and I'll, I'll, I'll enter the order, which defeats the whole purpose, but, I mean, you can manually trade it. The quantity you want to trade, the markets you want to trade, and here's what's cool. You can trade long or short or take both longs and short. Why would you do that? Well, if it's a seasonally weak period of time for a stock or a sector, if it's a seasonally weak period, only take sell signal. If it's a seasonally strong period, only take long signals. So maybe like in the VXX, if it, if it get through a period that right now we might see volatility rise, I don't want to take sell signals. I only want to take buy setups because volatility is going to rise. And that thing's going to provide more profits. I don't want to sell it if volatility rises. So I would turn, or you have the choice, to turn off the short side. That's a pretty cool feature. Now, this is a one-time purchase fee. There's the, the catch. There is a catch. You need proper training, number one. And more importantly, you need the lifetime package for John Person. The indicators work. But with that, you get TradeStation's free scanners and radar screen. TradeStation used to charge a monthly fee. That is no longer applicable. The John Person's lifetime package is 3500 The Algo system is 3297 It's a one-time purchase fee. Now, let me tell you about this. We can only issue 73 more licenses. It's strictly regulated. And I'm going to tell you why. We have to limit these licenses to not only ensure the integrity, but there's a uh, potential possible acquisition of the product itself. Just as a fair disclosure, this is not something you're going to see, um, you know, being sold for the next 30 years unless there's something different. But this is probably some of our best work I've ever done in my life, and I'm stoked about it. It's incredible. Now, if you're interested in learning more about this, we have several... Uh, opportunities to get retail traders on board with this because I think this is dynamically going to change how you trade and and what you trade. There's a bonus package and I'm going to give you my strategy settings for the VIX. There's a bundle package discount that's available and it expires September 10th. There is a link to get this in uh, the system. So we're going to send that link to you and then Finally, I just want to mention, in this November, we're having a three-day seminar down here in Vegas, in, in Vegas, listen to me, in Florida, it's the ALGO Seminar, the three-day investment seminar for active traders. Anyway, I thought this is actually ALGO for the uh, link in uh, uh, kind of cool stuff, but that right there is this link for the seminar. So we have two things that we wanted to share with you and how you can get your hands on this. Find out more about it by clicking on the link persons.com algo and if you click on that link it will get you exactly where you want to go on uh, the persons algo quant strategy system. So I'm just going to get that out there for you guys so you can see it for yourself. The landing page, read it over. This is something that I believe is going to, without a doubt, revolutionize how you trade. It is the most exciting thing that I've ever come across and developed, and, and I'm, I would have to implore you, if you're real serious about trading and you want to try to beat these quant algo traders, guys, this is how to get it. And just to let you know and, and to finally sum this up, 
when you go and you go to the algo scanner and you want to format the strategy you format the strategy you go status on off generate automatic execution you hit agree and baby you're trading and that's how that all works so you will get not only training but I also offer everybody the chance to go through and check this website out and and go do a, a little bit of reading on this and you will find yourself giving us a call because again there's only going to be 70 we can only issue 73 licenses so with that said I thank you all very much that concludes our time today